Uh, hi, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a talk about writing scalable distributed systems using Elixir. Uh, I'm Odit. I'm a software developer for Nilenso, which is an employee-owned software consultancy. We have a desk right outside if you want more information on that. Uh, we write high-throughput web scale services for a living. And uh, this talk is uh, primarily about a live game engine that I built for uh, one of our clients called Insider.in. Uh, it's out on prod if you want to check it out. All right, so this is briefly the agenda of the talk. Uh, first, we'll discuss why Elixir is a good fit for writing a distributed system. Then we'll take a sneak peek under the hood, uh, figure out how things work on the Elixir VM, uh, and also introduce some of the constructs that Elixir provides for writing distributed systems. And once we have that tool set, uh, we will go through writing a dummy live game engine. And then we'll rinse and repeat, make it better, more redundant, more powerful, so on and so forth. Right. So why should you use Elixir for writing a distributed system? Uh, also, by the way, throughout the stock, I, would use, I, I may use Elixir and Erlang interchangeably, because even though they are two different languages, uh, at their heart, the ideology to writing a distributed system is very same. Right. Uh, also, before that, let's have a very brief conversation about why distributed systems are hard in general. And I'll not go into any depth at all, because if we go into any detailed discussion on this topic, we'll be stuck here for a very long time. Right. So these things, state, computation, reliability, and ordering of events, they are easy to reason about when you are in a single node context, whereas, uh, whereas if you move to a distributed system, uh, just the mental overhead to reason about these things become very large. Right? So uh, let's take the instance of state. Uh, a database running on a single node would be the primary example of state running on a single node. And uh, it's very easy to reason about this thing because you have a single source of truth. You don't have to worry about replication or sharding and whatnot. And you can easily follow through data evolution. right? Uh, on this setup, if you just add, uh, let's say, a read-only replica, now you have to worry about replication and also about failovers. And also what happens during that small window wherein uh, your primary is failing over to the secondary, right? Uh, yeah, so like I said, the complexity simply explodes uh, when you go into the context of a distributed system. So why use Elixir? Well, the very first thing is uh, Elixir is distributed out of the box. You don't have to use any external library. You just uh, write something in your configuration file or just write this one command on your terminal, which I'll show later, and bang, you have a distributed cluster uh, running Erlang nodes in parallel. Uh, the second thing I want to highlight is uh, Elixir uses asynchronous message passing across the board. So uh, this may not seem that powerful. However, what this ensures is that your communication mechanism remains the same. Uh, whether you are communicating locally to a process running on your own VM or to a different process running somewhere on AWS Cloud, right? So the mental overhead of thinking about, hey, how is this communication going on is exactly the same. Uh, the third thing is there's no sharing at all. Like all the processes in uh, Elixir or Erlang, they have their own uh, data and there's no sharing at all. And since there's no shared data, we have sort of sidestepped the entire set of problems that we have because of concurrent access of data. Uh, the other things are Elixir provides excellent primitives for dealing with concurrency, and hence by extension, parallel computation. It also provides uh, primitives for handling fault tolerance. I'm pretty sure many of you would have heard about supervisors. Uh, if not, we'll have a, a, a small chat uh, regarding that in the following section. All right. Uh, the next section, uh, what goes under the hood, which is like what happens inside the Erlang VM. So Erlang VM is known as the Beam virtual machine. Beam stands for Beyond's Erlang abstract machine. Beyond is the person who maintains the code base for uh, Beam. There also used to be Joe's Erlang abstract machine, which was maintained by Joe Armstrong. Uh, Beam is like any other uh, virtual machine. Uh, it compiles your code down to bytecode, and then it runs it on the machine. Erlang, Elixir, Gleam, LFE, these are some of the languages that can be compiled down to the bytecode by, by the Beam. Uh, yeah, that is it. Uh, all right, let's get into the thick of things. Uh, so what is a process? A process in uh, Erlang terminology actually means a thread of execution. So think green threads. Uh, because they are like super lightweight. Uh, they have a very small memory footprint. They are very fast 
to create and terminate and the scheduling overhead for them is like super low. So a, a typical process uh, that you create uh, in Elixir will cost you like 600 bytes of memory. So because of this small uh, memory footprint, you can potentially create millions and millions of processes uh, even on a single machine. Uh, all right, so the next point is communicate via message passing. So the only way to tell a process to do something is via sending it a message. You cannot go in and fiddle with its state. You cannot uh, access its state as such. You can only send it a message, and then uh, as per the discretion of the process, it will do whatever it wants to do. Right? And every process is single-threaded. What I mean by that is a process will read the first message from its message mailbox, execute, update its state, read the next message, execute, update, so on and so forth until it gets suspended. Uh, so I'm not sure if that diagram is visible, but this is what the memory layout of a process looks like for an Elixir process. So on the top, you have uh, the process control board, uh, which contains things like the process's ID, if it has a name, uh, what was the initial call, and the pointer to the latest mailbox message. And then uh, there's this contiguous block of memory uh, on top of it, which we have stack, and at the bottom we have heap. So stack grows from top to bottom, whereas heap grows from bottom up. Stack, stack contains things like uh, local variables, function parameters, whereas heap contains larger things like uh, your mailbox messages. So in such a scenario, uh, uh, the garbage collection happens when the stack meets the heap. So like either if you get too many messages in your heap and it grows way too much, or if the number of local variables that you have for your function's execution, it, it's way too much and it touches the heap, that's when the garbage collection will happen. And uh, to deal with it, uh, Elixir has either compaction or full copy. So uh, what I mean by that is like the new memory requirement, uh, if it is small enough to be uh, addressed uh, in the same memory block, then uh, uh, the, that both the stack and the heap would be compacted and the memory in the middle would be freed up. Otherwise, what happens is it will copy over the entire uh, block, uh, entire memory block into a completely new lo memory location uh, so as to allocate uh, other thing, uh, so as to allocate more memory to it. Uh, one thing of notice, uh, one thing worth noticing is that uh, garbage collection always runs on uh, the process's CPU schedule. So what I mean by that is, where garbage collection would run when your process has the CPU. So it can essentially eat into the CPU time of your process. And hence, if you're doing too much garbage collection, uh, the throughput of your process can go down. So that. Then there's something called the schedulers. These are the processes that actually provide, uh, well, they are not the process, but these are the things that actually provide processes with CPU. Uh, and on the right, I don't think if it's visible, but uh, on the right, we have a finite state machine of all the different kind of states a process can be in. So you can see there's runnable, and from runnable, it can transition to running, and then garbing is garbage collecting, and then you have exiting, and so on and so forth. So schedulers, they keep a queue of all the runnable processes among, within them. And what they'll do is they'll pick up the very first process from this queue, give it the CPU to start executing. Uh, the schedulers are soft preemptive. What I mean by that is, uh, if, even if a process has overshot its CPU quota, the scheduler will not suspend it. It would let it run till the process goes to some, uh, till the process goes to the next valid state, be it suspended or exiting or, or waiting. Whatnot. So what this allows is, uh, your scheduler does not have to worry about intermediate execution state, right? So, and this allows for faster scheduling because now you don't need to persist, hey, my process was in the middle of this execution, so I need to store the stack variable somewhere and whatnot, right? So this is how you would write a process in Elixir. Uh, uh, apologies for the very small font size I had to smoosh it in. Uh, however, uh, this, is the, this is the more interesting part. So here what I'm doing is I'm starting off a receive block, which is saying that, hey, uh, I will block till I get a message in my mailbox. When I do get this message, if it is exit, I'll just do shutdown. Otherwise, uh, what I'll do is I'll print the message and then uh, call myself recursively, right? 
Uh, on the right hand side, on the GIF, if you can see, I'm starting off the same process. Uh, and uh, now I'll send it a message, which is hello. And you can see it gets printed on the, on the console. And if I exit, it just says shut down. And if I check for the process's aliveness, it says it's not alive anymore. Uh, all right. Uh, so processes, by default, they don't have any names associated with them. Uh, however, they do have unique bids. And that's the only way that you can talk with them. So you'll say that, hey, send a message to a process with this bid. So process registrations are a way around that, so that you can uh, ha give it a more meaningful name. Uh, so uh, there are certain strategies to do that. On the left, we have uh, the inbuilt strategies that are present in both Elixir and Erlang. On the right-hand side, we have some libraries that do that. So no name is basically you don't give any name to your process, and uh, the only way to communicate it now is via uh, the PID. So if you don't have reference to the PID, you cannot send that particular process any message. Uh, local registration means that uh, uh, all the processes that are running on your local VM, they would be able to uh, contact the process that is registered locally. If you are if you are on a different VM altogether, you will not be able to contact with this process. Uh, a global is like the globally registered process, so like anyone anywhere can send it a message. Uh, these two libraries, PG2, Swarm, they are used for the same thing. Uh, uh, however, capital R registry, this is uh, something more specific to Elixir. It's, although it's a built-in, it's not an external library, but it's only specific to uh, Elixir. That's why it's on the right-hand side. All right, uh, so supervisors. Uh, so supervisors are like specialized processes that have only one job, which is to monitor other processes. Uh, so they are the ones who help us create like a really fault-tolerant applications by uh, automatically restarting the child processes that they are they are monitoring. So uh, Erlang has Erlang is touted to have like nine nines of availability, and uh, what they do is they would smush supervisors on top of supervisors so that like you have a complete supervision tree so that your application almost never ever dies. Right. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about are gen servers. So the process uh, thing that we discussed so far, uh, they are also applicable for a gen server. It's more like a better abstraction. Uh, like it provides a better abstraction over state, uh, although under the hood, it's still just a process. And uh, in a production code, you would typically never use a naked process. You would uh, almost always use a gen server, and we'll see why. So. Uh, so it has so so if you remember the how we did message passing to a process and uh, at the very end of the receive block we have we were calling itself recursively gen server sort of abstract that particular thing out uh, that behavior in gen servers is kind of implicit so the way of communicating to a gen server are like these three functions info is exactly the same as sending a process a particular message Cast is also like info. However, instead of PID, you can uh, like give the na process name here. And under the hood, it would uh, figure out what's the PID associated with that name and then send it to that particular process. Call is more interesting because call will do what cast does. Like it will do the name translation to the PID. But it also has like a timeout. So in a way, it is sort of allowing you to do synchronous code uh, by doing asynchronous message passing. So what happens when I do gen server.call is I'll send a message to a process. And whatever the timeout is, I'll wait for that much time without doing anything for that process to reply back to me. And if that, that does not happen, then I'll get a timeout. And then uh, I, as a process, can do whatever I want to do on that timeout. Uh, all right. Uh, so let's discuss distributed nodes really quick. So nodes, uh, well, Elixir VMs are known as nodes in the Elixir land. Uh, so to have a distributed Elixir cluster, uh, well, you can connect them either by providing the startup configuration or by like manually giving it uh, the connect command, which we'll uh, get to see really quickly. Uh, the interesting thing here is like they always form a fully connected mesh network, which basically mean like if you have five nodes in your cluster, each of them would have a 
separate TCP con connection connecting to each of those things. So it will be like fully connected. And uh, the other important thing is uh, each of these nodes will keep on sending a heartbeat message to the other processes so that uh, the other folks are av aware of the liveness of this thing. Right. So, uh, so in this GIF on the left hand side and the right hand side, I start to Erlang VMs. Uh, if you see the node.list uh, on both sides is empty right now. And then I'll just say node.connect and give it the other VM's name. And uh, you'll see that uh, the node.list is magically populated on this side with the other node and on that side with this uh, particular node. Right? And uh, now what I'll do is I'll, uh, like I I'll register the name for the console as following console and then I'll send this particular console a message, this particular paid a message. And on the right hand side, if I flush, I'll get that message here. So voila, you now have a connected uh, Elixir cluster. Uh, yeah, however, you'll not do this thing on prod. You would obviously use something like Kubernetes or maybe uh, some sort of DNS configuration. Uh, so uh, there's a library out there which is called libcluster. What it does is it leverages Kubernetes metadata API to figure out uh, if there's a new new pod that has spun up and then it will automatically add to your cluster. Uh, the interesting thing to note here is like uh, although auto node, auto new node discovery does not happen, however auto, uh, like uh, the, the cluster will automatically detect if uh, an existing node has died out because of missed heartbeats. All uh, right. So I think we have all the tool sets uh, that we may require to writing a new live game engine. So all right. Uh, so if you look uh, at the live quiz engine from a very high perspective, these are like uh, its primary responsibilities. So first, it will what it will do is like it will publish a question, and then uh, it will receive an evaluate answer from the players. And then finally, it would broadcast the result, right? So uh, if you like really, really squint your eyes, can you see that it's sort of like a restricted chat? Uh, so think of like an IRC server, right? So when you send it a message, it actually broadcasts it to all the other clients that are there on your uh, IRC room, right? Uh, however, uh, this way it's more restricted because now it's like, the server will only first publish the question, and when it receives the answer, it does not actually broadcast your answer. It actually broadcasts just the summary of that thing. Right? All right. Uh, moving on. Uh, for this demo, uh, I have written a TCP listener. So what this thing does is it, like, it will spawn up a new TCP connection for every new uh, player that you connect to. Uh, this is just for demo purpose. In uh, actual production, you would you typically use something else. So uh, we, in our project, use something called MQTT. Uh, that is also a very lightweight protocol uh, for doing uh, for doing pub sub and message passing. Um, MQTT uh, is more interesting because it provides us uh, things like uh, delivery guarantees, like exactly once or at least once. Uh, Okay, so let's move on to the very first approach that we may take to writing uh, this live game engine, uh, which is like just have one single process that sends the question as well as receives the answer and does the summarization and then broadcasts the summary again, right? So um, it would look something like this. Uh, so the interesting bits are these. So what I'm doing here is like I'm starting a just a single process. I'm registering it as single, and this is global, so anyone can call it. And then if you look at the incoming uh, function, which is uh, being passed to the listener in the previous code as a callback. So what it's doing is like, hey, whenever you get a new message, just queue up that message in the message queue of this single process, right? So uh, this approach would work for a smaller number of players because obviously it's like single threaded. It, it's absolutely single threaded because uh, you just have one process which is doing all the stuff. Like it's, uh, so it, it's, it's actually publishing the question. It's also evaluating the answers. And then uh, also like once all the answers have been evaluated, it will then publish the summary. So the problem uh, obviously with this uh, approach is that 
you, since you have just a single process, its message queue will build up if you have more number of players. And uh, the process will keep on executing it one after the other. And eventually, the entire time for your round would be like really huge. You don't want that. So let's go to the other extreme. Let's create a process for every player. right? Uh, and this would look something like this. So which is like for every new connection that you get, uh, you start off a worker. And uh, you pass in the, that particular worker's incoming connection as the callback. So what happens now is like every for, for every player, you have a new worker process that's running that can, uh, uh, that can evaluate that person's answer. So uh, this approach is much faster because it is like one is to one map between uh, the player and the process. Uh, so you have a lot of concurrency. Uh, however, uh, this approach will not work in our live game engines example. This would perfectly work if you have a, like a regular service which has like a consistent traffic across the board. However, if you look at a, a live game, uh, so the traffic is very, very spiky, right? Because you publish a question and then immediately everyone keeps answering and then like you have this traffic spike and then it just dies down until the next round comes up, right? So in that scenario, if you have like a million players playing your live game, what would happen is uh, you would suddenly have like a million processes that are up for scheduling and the process queue at your scheduler would be very large. And hence, although uh, like your process is, uh, like your process would be very fast to evaluate uh, the response, but the time for this process to get CPU would be larger. And hence, this is also, uh, like this will work, but uh, it will not scale very well for a very large uh, user base. Right, so the third strategy would be to use something balanced, so like, have uh, your worker processes map, like have n worker processes and have each worker process map to m players. Um, so uh, yeah, so if you look at the code here, so what uh, what's happening here is like when you start off a mass, uh, of the aggregator process, uh, at the very start itself, it will start off a bunch of worker processes. And then as and when a new connection happens as in when a new player joins in, what you're doing is you're hashing that particular player to a particular worker ID so that now uh, like you would, every, every worker would actually support a bunch of players, right? So in this scenario, what you can do is like, you're obviously doing sharding and uh, this approach would definitely work. Uh, and also this is a approach which is discussed in the Discord's blog post about uh, scaling to 5 million concurrent users. Uh, also, one uh, other thing that I missed uh, while talking about a uh, one-to-one one and uh, n 2 m uh, strategies is that since these processes are independent, uh, so you're not actually restricted by one host machine size. So these processes, they can actually reside on any machine. So like if you have a five machine cluster, you can say that, hey, this machine hosts uh, one process and uh, the other machine hosts like 20 processes and whatnot. Uh, all right, so uh, we do have a live game engine right now. It sort of works. Uh, it's mostly like an MVP because if you take this to production, uh, it will fail for some of the reasons that uh, we're gonna discuss now. So A, we don't have any supervision at all. Right? Uh, like uh, the worker processes are just being spun up uh, at the very top. So the very first thing that you would do is add supervisors on top of that so that even if the worker process dies, there's something to restart them, right? Uh, the other thing that uh, you would potentially do is separate out the processes. So uh, in all the three approaches that we discussed, uh, the singular process was doing all the heavy lifting, right? It, it was a maintaining player state, it was accepting answers, it was also executing business logic. So typically in production, you would want to separate out these three responsibilities into three different processes. And uh, so that on, not only modularizes your code, you can then apply different supervision strategies as well, right? right? So for instance, you would not want to lose state ever. So maybe you would want to keep that process much more securely. And as for like uh, the process that's executing business logic, that can be restarted as and when you require. So maybe that doesn't need a very good, well, uh, you would actually supervise it, but uh, I mean, the supervision strategy between a process executing business logic and a process that maintains state would be certainly different, right? Uh, so the third thing that I want to talk about is uh, 
distributed processes. So we discussed that uh, in uh, the one-to-one one -one and the M2N approach, you can actually uh, distribute these processes across nodes. So that works. However, uh, if you remember, at the very start, I said that Erlang uh, or Elixir uh, distributed cluster actually forms a fully connected mesh. And these mesh are actually connected via a single TCP connection, right? So now if you're sending multiple messages between two particular nodes, they would be serialized over this TCP connection. So uh, it's fine to distribute no, uh, processes across nodes. However, uh, you need to be aware that this particular communication between two different nodes is actually being serialized over a singular TCP uh, channel. So uh, typically to address this thing, uh, what you would do is something called an island architecture, wherein uh, processes can communicate to each other in the same island. When I say island, it means like uh, if they are on the same Erlang node. However, uh, as and when they need to com communicate to a different uh, process on a, on a different node altogether, that needs to be a more specialized operation. So that sort of reduces your cross node chatter. And hence, you don't hit the network lit, uh, latency as well as like the single serialization of the TCP connection. Uh, all right, uh, that's all I have. Uh, these are some of the references that I used for these slides. Uh, and thank you.